So the, the young per people have been in a series on purity, and a bunch of them had questions. And so the youth pastor said, Pastor, we're trying to find a time when they can come. We can get them there. They want to have a question answer session. So they all took off over there, and they're having a question answer a debrief uh, from you know, some of the teaching, and, which is real good because this is a real problem in our culture. When you have uh, eight-year-olds, about 20% of eight-year-olds finding uh, visual stuff that's unbelievable in video because of pop-ups, you know, we have something that's got to be done in our culture to change that. And uh, in fifth grade, I will ask how many have seen visual images, and I've quit doing it, but for years I did that, and, uh, and these are church kids, these are our church kids, and 80% of them had already seen them in fifth grade at the beginning of fifth grade, 80%. So here's how I teach purity to fifth graders. I tell them that when you're a little, when you're a little, uh, a little uh, child, uh, you're told to wear clothes, and why is that? Well, they know, they tell the answer, because nobody's supposed to look at you without clothes on. I said, right. And I said, what about touch? Do your parents tell you anything about, oh yeah, you can't be touched in private places. I said, true. I said, so now when does that change? Does that change when you get to junior high? This is my fifth grade Wednesday class. Does that change when you get to high school? Does that change when you get to college? When does that change? And of course, I've taught them it changes when you marry one person and then you're married and now it's okay to look and touch and now you can make babies. They accept that. Those fifth graders know a lot more than parents want to admit they know. They know a lot of stuff. And so that's how I handle that, and I believe it's a good way to handle that. And then I make sure that about 50 times, sometimes twice on a Wednesday night, sometimes three times on a Wednesday night, I'll ask them this question. Who does a boy marry? Who does a girl marry? And why do you believe that? They said, because you said it. No, I said, let's read the scriptures. So we read in the Bible. I say, now I ask them, they all know because the Bible says so. And who wrote, who, who, who's the author of the Bible? Who put this by? God. So it's God's way, right? Right. Because you know what? There's a confusing message going around about human sexuality. And, and, and we, need, we need to correct it. So uh, when I felt led to do 1 Corinthians, Pastor Hawkins knows it. I'll hear something. And I, I always go to him. He kind of helps me because he's a, he's a wizard. And uh, not in a, not in a, not in a uh, witchy way. But... Uh, <laughs> Like, you know what I mean. <laughs> so, uh, anyway, he, uh, he helps me out real good. And, uh, and I didn't know that all these texts were so difficult in 1 Corinthians. Because some of it I knew, but some of these chapters right in here are not so easy. Uh, but so we're in chapter 6, uh, verse, starting in verse 8. And, uh, and the first point, the, the whole idea is that our body is to glorify God. The title of glorify God in your body. And the first point is all sin will be judged. All sin will be judged. And that doesn't mean that your sin will judge you and damn you, but all sin will be judged. And Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, and this is after lawsuits among believers, and here's what is happening. You've got somebody cheating and suing another brother. And he's talking about two Christians suing each other, and somebody's cheating. And so he's saying, you don't minimize what you're doing. Your sin is like these other sins. So he's drawing him in to this kind of behavior between that. And uh, verse eight says, instead you yourselves cheat and do wrong and you do this to your brothers. We're talking about lawsuits now in the first part, but I'm not gonna deal with that, that's simple. You just know that today, uh, you know, it's difficult to carry this out because our court system is different, our, 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 our culture is different, our structure of government's different, everything's different. I mean, if you have two Christians that actually will sit down with a pastor or a wise leader, then yes, we can work it out, but it, it never happens. It just never happens. I mean, I, I'm sorry, but it doesn't. And so he goes, he says, uh, uh, he says uh, uh, do you not know that the wicked will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. And then he's likening this person who's cheating his brother, and he's saying, here's some other sins. He's saying the wicked will not inherit the kingdom of God. He said, do not be deceived, neither the sexually immoral, 
and that's the same word we had this morning from pornea, uh, uh, and nor idolaters or adulterers, nor male prostitutes or homosexual offenders, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor slanderers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. And that is what some of you were, but you are washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of God. Pastor Hawkins talked about that. I'm not going to handle that too much, but everything is permissible for me, he goes on, but not everything is beneficial. Everything is permissible for me, but I will not be mastered by any. Food for the stomach and stomach for food, but God will destroy them both. The body is not meant for sexual immorality, but the Lord and the Lord for the body. But by his power, God raised the Lord from the dead and he will raise us also. Do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ himself? So, so I then take the members, so I'm sorry, shall I then take the members of Christ and unite them with a the prostitute? Never. Do you not know that he who unites himself with the prostitute is one with her in body? For it is said the two will become one flesh. But he who unites himself with the Lord is one with him in spirit. Flee from sexual immorality. That's all kinds of sexual immorality. That's, that's everything. He says flee it. All other sins that commits are outside his body. Look at this. But he who sins sexually sins against his own body. That's so important to understand that. Do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have received from God? You are not your own. You were bought with a price. Therefore, honor God with your body. I'm going to stick real close to my notes because otherwise I could preach a real long time. And I can't. I cannot do that, okay? So I'm going to stick right here. Uh, so you yourselves do wrong and cheat. There's no place for dishonest dealing with Christians. But how much less place is there for dishonest dealing uh, between Christians? How many have rejected the things of God, the fellowship of the saints, because of dishonesty and cheating among believers, between believers? And so he says in that verse, you yourselves do wrong and you cheat. And then the second thing it says is, do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? And Paul is speaking strongly to the brother who cheated, who did the wrong. Don't you realize how serious your sin is? The only thing you can gain from cheating your brother is eternity with the unrighteous. That's what he's saying. Paul was not categorically denying that this man was saved. Paul says he is among the brethren. However, Paul will not allow a religious faith, quote unquote, that is separate from actions. If a Christian can cheat and defraud his brothers without conscience, it may be fairly asked, is that brother really a brother? Is he truly a Christian? This man who had wronged his brother was putting himself in bad company with, as it lists, with fornicators, idolaters, adulterers, homosexuals, sodomites, thieves, covetous, the covetous, the revilers, the extortioners, and none of those who live characterized by these seeds, these sins, will inherit the kingdom of God. There you see it. No doubt the man figured, sure, what I'm doing to my brother isn't, isn't good, but hey, it's not that bad. Paul wants him to know just how bad it was. And we shouldn't think that a Christian who has committed an act of fornication or homosexuality or any of those listed sins will be automatically excluded from the kingdom of God. It's not like a one time. So since Paul describes these people by their sins, he means those who have, their, he's talking about when he says they won't inherit the kingdom of God, those that have been dominated and characterized by these sins. So then is an occasional act of fornication or homosexuality no big deal to God? Absolutely. I'm not saying that. Of course it is. Because it goes against everything that we have been given in Jesus and because of the lifestyle of sin begins with single acts of sin and then it grows into lifestyles and it becomes who we are the man who cheated his brother had to see that if his life was dominated and characterized by this sin as much as any of the other people paul described the others that seem to us like bigger sins he should be just as concerned for his salvation as other people. And I've said that often. It's not that any sin, like gossip, you look, you'll find that slander and gossip among these moral sins and among sins where it says, and there won't be anybody like that in heaven and liars. So what is your lifestyle? We teach our young people in fifth grade, the Philippians 4, 8, what to think on because thoughts lead to actions that lead to, 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 to habits that lead to a lifestyle. Your thought 
before you think something, then you act on it, and then you act on it over and over, it becomes a habit, and that habit becomes a lifestyle, and now that's who you are. You're not just one that lied, you are now a liar. That's who you are, and that's the way it is with all sins. So this guy was a cheat, okay? And it says, nor homosexual, since this is such a clear condemnation of homosexuality, those who would like to justify the practice, they say Paul is speaking of homosexual prostitution, not a loving, caring, homosexual relationship. But taken in context, there's no doubt, that's not right, God is speaking of homosexual acts, period, of all kinds. The words, the Greek words, uh, malakai, homosexuals, which literally refers to male prostitutes, and arsenikataya, or sodomites, is sodomites, the word is a generic term for all homosexual practice. It's clear he's not talking about monogamous homosexual behavior. He's talking about homosexual behavior. Paul was not writing to a or of a homophobic culture. This homosexuality was rampant in Paul's culture. 14 of the first 15 Roman emperors were bisexual or homosexual. And at the very time Paul was writing, Nero was the emperor. And Nero had taken a boy named Sporus and had him castrated and took him and married him with a full ceremony and brought him to the palace with a great procession and made the boy his wife. Later, that same Nero uh, lived with another man, and Nero declared himself to be the other man's wife, talking about a messed up culture they lived in. And in this list of sins, homosexuality uh, is described, but it's described right along with other sins, many of which those who so strongly denounce homosexuality are living in pornography and other sorts of sinful behaviors that are equally listed right there. Just take a look at them. Fornicators, adulterers, covetous, desiring what you, wanting more and more and more, uh, drunkards, uh, and, and so uh, you know, they, they, it's all included there. So, but you know what? It's all sin. So don't be. God hates all sin. He hates all sin for a reason, because sin hurts people, and He loves people. That's why it's not being mean. So the first point I want you to see is all sin will be judged. God's talking about it, and it's important that you clean your life up. And then the second thing is all sin can be forgiven. In 1 Corinthians 6, 11, it says this, but you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Son of God. So uh, notice I mentioned this morning, Matthew 1, 21, that the angel said to Joseph, he will say, call him Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. All sin is a concern to God, but, and all sin can be forgiven. And such were some of you. And Pastor Hawkins, not long ago, preached on that. You get that and you listen to that. It was one of the best sermons I ever heard. It says you were washed and cleansed, in other words, by the blood of Jesus, by the word of God, the washing, you were, uh, you were uh, sanctified. That's the process of becoming holy. And if you don't ask God to, to speak in light, to shine on you and remind you of what you did through the day and, and you're, not, you're not sensitive to God pointing out areas of your life that are just not right with God, then you won't grow, you won't grow to be more holy like God. God says, be holy for I am holy. Holiness is not something that's unattainable or he wouldn't say it, is it? Holiness should be what the church is. That's what Paul writes about so much. And then, not only sanctified, but justified. And I teach my fifth graders, that means just as if I hadn't sinned by faith through Jesus Christ. You're in Christ, you walk with Christ, the blood of Christ pours over you, and you don't have any condemnation anymore. Just as if you hadn't sinned by faith in Jesus, he's forgiven you. In the name, and look at the Trinity that Paul naturally gives out multiple times in his books, mentioned right here. So if you think that our God is not a triune, one God in three persons, look, in the name of the the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God, speaking of Father, Spirit of our God. First, and then the third thing is what is permitted by God is not our only guide for behavior. What is permitted by God is not our only God guide, rather, of behavior. In 1 Corinthians 6, 12 to 15, he starts talking about all things, and this is a different version, all things are lawful for me, but all things are not helpful. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be brought under any the power of any. You know, in that section this morning, we were talking about immorality of a certain member that was sleeping with his, uh, 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 his uh, 
uh, a father's wife, which was uh, incestuous and, and, and horrible, uh, you know, in that, in that deal. And, and in this section here where certain uh, sins are described, Paul has brought up the issue of, of sexual conduct of Christians. And now he will address some of the questions and problems the Corinthian, the Corinthians and the Christians in Corinth had in regarding to understanding them. And one of the things that Paul has taught in other books, and the Corinthians had jumped on this, all things are lawful. And they were saying that it was lawful to, to because as the stomach needs food, you desire it and you crave it, and that doesn't make a man who he is. And Paul's dealing with that one, and when it comes to morality, it's different. And they were saying, it's okay to gratify my natural feelings of the flesh for sexual sexual pleasure because God gave it to me just like he gave me an appetite for food. Wrong, Paul. That's what Paul is addressing. He's saying wrong. I'm not saying that. And so the Christians in Corinth were taking the idea of all, all, are law, all things are lawful and applying it to areas that, that, that said they were giving them liberty as a license to sin, specifically the sexual sins. And then he says in that verse, uh, uh, chapter 7, 4, uh, it, you see it also under the authority where it talks about the husband and wife's body belongs, the wife's body to the man and has authority and the, the husband's uh, body for the wife and she has authority. And so we're talking about not you know, forsaking each other but becoming coming one physically and all of that. And it has about talking about being, and that's 1 Corinthians 7, 4. This same phrase when it, we just read, I will not be brought under the power of any, meaning they won't be uh, brought under underneath uh, the authority of a prostitute. And that's what it's talking about. It's talking about, uh, uh, about that. And so in verses 13 and 14, you see that there's a number four is appetites for food and sex are not the same. Food for the stomach and the stomach for foods, but God will destroy both, it says in verse 13, and, and, and them. And now the body is not for sexual immorality, but for the Lord and the Lord for the body. And God raised up the Lord and will raise, up, raise us up by his power. Foods for the stomach and the stomachs for food. So that's just what I was talking about. And uh, so they were just justifying by giving their bodies to whatever their bodies wanted. My body wants food, so I eat. My body wants sex, so I, ha I hire a prostitute. What's the problem? That was the attitude of the Corinthians. But Paul will not let them take that slogan, which apl applies to irrelevant food restrictions, and apply it to immorality. The body is not for sexual immorality, he says, but for the Lord and the Lord for the body. And so because of our lustful appetites, it may seem that God did not make our bodies for sexual immorality. Rather, it may seem that he did in their minds, but God did not make our bodies that way. Sinful Adam caused that, right? The fall of man, the body is not for sexual immorality. So the fifth thing I want you to see is our bodies are part of the body of Christ. And so she, we should never be joined to a prostitute. Do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ? Shall I then take the members of Christ and make them members of a harlot? Certainly not. Or do you not know, this is verses 15 to 17, that he who is joined to a harlot is one body with her. For the two, he says, shall become one flesh, but he who is joined to the Lord is one spirit with him. Do you not know? Apparently, the Corinthians didn't know. It was their culture, very, very immoral uh, culture. So obviously when he says, do you not know? They didn't know. That's what Paul was saying. He, they really didn't know. And so he's teaching them and he's teaching the church. So the church will get right because they're not doing right. And he says, your bodies are members of Christ. So when an individual Christian commits immorality, uh, it disgraces the entire body of Christ, linking the body to Christ of Christ to immorality. And says he is joined to the harlot is one body with her, one flesh. In that sexual relationship, a husband and wife becomes one flesh in a way that's under God's blessing. When it's outside the marriage, the partners become one flesh in a way that breaks God's heart. God forgive us, amen? Whether it's in mind or deed. A world, our world is messed up. A person desiring, desiring a casual sexual encounter may not want to become one flesh with their partner, but in some spiritual sense, they do, whether they like it or not. And it means there's less to give to the Lord and to the partner that God had intended. There's no such thing as casual when it comes to intimacy. Since we belong to Jesus, 
body, soul, and spirit. We have no right to give any part of ourselves to anything that's unauthorized. It's like uh, outside of marriage, any kind of behavior that is, that's not biblical intimacy is like a man robbing a bank. He gets something, but it's not his, and it's sin. He, he who is joined to the Lord in the heat of the lustful passions, spiritual things may seem far away, yet at, yet at the root of most lustful passion is the desire of love, acceptance, and adventure, all of which is far better and more completely satisfied with one spirit with him in a relationship with the Lord, in a relationship that's whole and biblical with a husband and wife. It never, immorality never leads to lasting love or satisfaction or wholeness. In number six, verse 18, it says, flee sexual immorality. Every sin that a man does that is outside the body, but he who commits sexual immorality sins against his own body. Flee, Paul tells us. Paul doesn't say to be brave and resist and stand up against it, the passion of sexual immorality, but to flee from its very presence. Who did that? Joseph, right? Joseph, he ran from it. And yes, it cost him, but he, he ran. And uh, that's exactly what many people have fallen because they thought they could resist it. Stay away from it. Flee it. Paul doesn't say that the Christians should flee, flee the act. He says flee the immorality of it. See, because God gave that act, that intimacy, as a beautiful thing and a precious gift to mankind and it, to use it powerfully to bond husband and wife together in true spiritual one flesh. Hebrews 13, 4 says, the bed, the marriage bed is undefiled. The relationship between a husband and wife is pure, holy, and good before God. But immorality, intimacy that's immoral, works against God's good purpose, working against a true godly one flesh relationship. To flee that immorality means more than just to not have intercourse, the outside, or any kind of activity that's not biblical with someone we're not married to. It means to flee the gratification sexually with someone uh, we are not married to. It means flee in that gratification of a thrill of something, whether it's inappropriate videos, movies, pictures, magazines, books, internet materials, or whatever it might be. It sins against your own body because the very act in the moment of pleasure is addictive, 40 times more addictive than heroin. Dopamine's released, that's just one thing. Dopamine alone is released at the moment of pleasure. It's 40 times more addictive than heroin. That's why God made uh, the act, the marriage act that consummates a marriage addictive because he wants you addicted to your spouse. He wants you addicted, glued to your husband, to your wife. And so we water it down when we act upon it inappropriately. Sin against your own body has a unique effect on the body, not in a physical way, but all, all, not only in a physical way, but also moral and spiritual ways. Augustine was a Christian who had a lot of trouble with keeping pure sexually. And for a long time, it kept him from really following God. He used to pray, God, make me pure, but not just yet. And then there came a point where he really turned everything over to God, and he stopped hanging around with his companions that he did the immorality with, and he start, stopped going to their neighborhood that he used to meet them. And once he was there on business, and on the street he met an old flame. She was glad to see him, and the girl he had been with many times started running with him, arms outstretched, saying, Augustine, Augustine, where have you been for so long? We've missed you so. Augustine did the only thing he could do. He started running the other way. She called out to him, Augustine, why are you running away? It's only me. He looked back while still running, and he shouted out, I'm running because I'm not me anymore. He looked back, and he says, I'm not me anymore. He was a different man because Jesus was living inside him in a different way. And if we had our lives changed enough by Jesus, it would show that our desire of purity would flee from the, the temptation. We're all tempted in all ways. Be honest. Stay away. Turn, turn, throw your computers away if you have to. Give them away if you have to. Do whatever you have to do to be pure. And last thing, number seven, is glorify God in your body. And that's what it says in 1 Corinthians 6, 19 and 20. Or do you not know your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit which is in you, whom you have from God, and you are not your own. You are bought with a price. Therefore glorify your God in your body and your spirit, which are God's. Paul said to the church in 1 Corinthians 3, 16, and we talked about that, that the church as a whole was the temple of the Holy Spirit. Now he says you individually are that temple and that in your body. So some Christians think that the devil can possess a Christian's spirit or soul, but that a Christian's body can be filled with, 
uh, uh, filled with demons so that the Christian must have those demons cast out by another person. But Paul makes it clear, listen to me, Paul makes it clear that our bodies belong to Jesus just as much as our spirits, and the, he is the owner of our body, and he is not subletting our body to demons. It is, it is impossible. You glorify God in your body, and the words in your spirit, and in your spirit were, may have been added by a scribe later because he thought it wasn't spiritual enough to glorify God with your bodies, but the, the great pastor of the uh, Chicago uh, uh, Moody, in Chicago, Moody, Moody's church, great Moody church in Chicago, uh, Ironside. Uh, he, he was born in uh, 1876, died in 1951. He pastored there for almost 20 years. And Ironside said, you glorify God in your body and the spiritual side will take care of itself. And I believe he's right. Amen? We're going to open these altars. Pastor Brett's just going to make some, a little quiet music to cover just a little bit nothing necessarily that'll make you sing the song and we'll open these altars for you to come down before god and just deal with your heart your mind your eyes may all that we do be pure father in jesus name i pray for anybody here that needs to clean up turn around run from be forgiven of have guilt removed and shame god just remove it all because today's the first day of the rest of our life like pastor hawkins preached you know, there's a cleansing, there's a forgiveness, there's a washing, there's a sanctification, there's a justification. It's all in Jesus. So, Lord, this is not to bring condemnation, but God, to help us to examine our heart. And, Father, for those that might be watching online, God, challenge their hearts to truly listen to the Word of God, to read Romans 1, where it's very clear, to read in Leviticus chapter 18, where it's very clear, to read the Bible and understand that there is a moral code, and it is a biblical code. One man, one woman, married for life if possible, with all possibility, that might glorify you in a family, a unit, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.